So please just make sure that you've got your mics off and your cameras off. And I think we'll just wait another minute or so to see if any other classes will just join shortly. Thank you, Lila. You can have your camera Okay, good morning, Year 7 and Year 8. I think we're up to about 70, uh, which is looking really good. I might just wait one more minute because I'm expecting a few more Year 8s than that uh, before I pass over to Professor Clark. And for those that are just joining, just to reiterate, if we can just make sure our microphones are off and our cameras are off as well, just to minimize disruption uh, for this talk. And I'll wait a few more seconds. Right, okay then, we're up to 120, which is looking really, really good, a healthy audience. Uh, so I think we ought to get this underway now. Um, so good morning, Year 7 and Year 8, and thank you very much for joining this very different uh, lesson this morning. Uh, this week's actually British Science Week in the whole country, uh, and so there's a whole load of events that are happening everywhere. Uh, and as a, a school, we've decided to run a few events for you uh, this week as well. And one of them is today, and it's going to be a really lovely talk delivered by uh, Professor Fiona Clark here. Uh, and she's very, very excited to, to deliver this. Uh, can I just ask to make sure that your microphones are off and your cameras are off whilst uh, Professor Clark is delivering this talk. And there will be a little bit of time to, to ask some questions, some Q&A at the end of the talk. So if you do have any questions about anything that, uh, uh, that she's talking about, just make a note of them uh, and then there'll be some time at the end for you to ask some questions, a bit of Q&A uh, about what she's talked about. OK, so uh, I think without further ado, I'll pass over to Professor Fiona Clark now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me? I can see Andrew and I can see Shaheen. If you can wave at me or thumbs up, you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. It's quite quiet, uh, Professor Clark. If you just maybe speak or shout a bit, then maybe we'll be able to hear you a bit more clearly. I'll put my volume up and that might work. So I tell you what, I've unplugged the earphone that's got the microphone in it. Let's try that one. Does that sound that's better? Perfect. That's excellent makes such a difference doesn't it okay um good morning year sevens and year eights uh, i wish i could say it's lovely to see you but uh, obviously i can't see you and i'm sad that we can't all be together today but that's fine um we're all so used to this kind of zoom methodology now that uh hopefully this will be a, a something quite normal to you um so i am a professor uh, it's quite new and i'll tell you about it later so it still makes me giggle every time someone calls me professor um, so feel free to just put Fiona in the chat if you want to ask any questions. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about careers in STEM. 
it's not my role to try and persuade you to become someone who works in STEM, but what I'd like to do is give you a flavour of the kind of work that I've done and the career I've had, just with stories of my life along the way and things that have happened, um, and hope to share with you the fact that actually you can have a lot of fun if you do choose to go into something that is STEM related. Um, now, Year 7, 8 is, is quite early in your career and you're probably not thinking about what job you want to do yet, but it's quite a good idea to have an idea of some of the things that you might want to go into. So this is one of those areas. So the first question is, well, what is STEM? Uh, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths, which you may know already. So it's anything to do with those aspects, science um, into being a scientist or using science in your work, technology and engineering, which is where I work, um, or using maths in, in some form in your career. So what I'm going to do, as I say, is I'm just going to walk through kind of my history, tell you some, some funny stories and some of my thoughts about how I've ended up where I am. Um, and hopefully that will be interesting to you. So if there are any questions, pop them in the chat. Um, I'm not looking at the chat at the minute, so I'll take those questions at the end, but feel free to pop them in. Right, let's find my mouse, see if this will work. Okay, so um, first of all, who am I? Um, how did I get into this? Uh, well, uh, that's me and my favourite jumper when I was about five in my school photo. Uh, I was born to a family that really didn't have any money. We were quite poor. My mum was a secretary. My dad worked as a bookkeeper for an accountant. Um, but we had a, a happy life. We lived opposite a park, so we were always playing. Um, and one of the things my mum and dad were really good about was to say, you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up. All you need to do is go to school and work reasonably hard and you can be anything you want to be. Um, well, I liked the you can be anything you want to be bit. I'm not sure I worked really hard at school and I did find school quite hard. I would say I was an average student. Um, I could do maths and I could do music. Um, I could do a bit of physics when I got to that, but um, anything that involved lots of writing, I found quite hard. I just didn't really enjoy the writing side of stuff. Um, so I kind of did the sums and I did the physics and, you know, I still like doing maths puzzles. They just, they, they make me kind of smile. Um, so that's what I ended up doing. I took A levels of maths and physics and eventually went on to, to university. Um, so one of the first bits of luck that I had in my life was actually getting into university. Nobody in my family had been before. And I knew I wanted to study maths. And my mum, bless her, my mum was even smaller than I am. If you could see me, I'm only about five foot two. I'm quite diddy. And mum was even smaller than that. And she said, well, if you want to study maths, you must go to Cambridge because that's where the best place is for maths. I knew no better. I didn't know anything was right or wrong. So I said, OK, I'll give that a go. And I sat the exam and I must have done something OK in the exam. I did quite like maths. and I was quite good at it. Uh, and I got some interviews to go and see whether I could join at Newnham College, which is where I did eventually go. So my first interview was with a lady whose aunt had worked at my school some years before. So we talked about my school uh, and how it had changed and all her aunt's school days and nothing about me and nothing about maths and nothing about my exam results, which was nice. And then the second person I met was a violinist. He was a real musician and I was a musician too. I'd done grade eight in piano and oboe. So we talked about music and nothing else. Um, and then the third lady, well, she was the, the head of the maths department and she was a bit more serious. And she asked me what books I'd read on mathematics around the subject, not textbooks. Now that's a really weird thing to ask somebody who's a mathematician because you don't read books, you do maths, you don't read books. But luckily my school had said, oh, it's worth reading some books because they often ask you that question. So I had found in the library, the smallest, thinnest book I could find that had maths in the title. And it was called How to Lie with Statistics, which was quite a good name as it turned out. And I read that on the train going to my interview and it was very short, so I flicked through it. And then when I was asked that question, have you read any books? I was able to say, actually, yes, I've just read a really interesting book called How to Lie with Statistics. And we had a chat about that um, and then other things. And I got the place. So that was for me, it was a real bit of luck because I happened to meet two people who were interested in things I was interested in. And I happened to have had that good piece of advice that I'd taken about reading the book. Um, so it kind of taught me quite early on that actually engaging with people and being kind and nice and respectful to people was really important because you'll find something in common and you'll be able to work with them and also when you're given bits of advice they're usually there for a reason so taking them is often a good thing to do so there I was very lucky and I got into Cambridge and that that picture in the middle is me with my maiden name and the fact that I'd made it to Cambridge awful hair I know but I was a strange child so that's fine 
So I did that and I struggled, if I'm honest, it was very hard. But what I did was I did lots of other subjects around the, the central math. So I learned some computing and I did a bit of a language course and that allowed me to gain points. So I got my degree. It's not a very good degree, but I got it and it says Cambridge and I will always have that. So then I came out and thought, right, what do I want to do? Um, when I was your age, I had no idea. When I came out of Cambridge, I had no idea. I knew I liked maths, but I didn't know what that would let me do. So I found myself thinking, well, where am I going to go? What job am I going to do? Um, and I really didn't know. So luckily, universities often have careers offices and you can go there and they say, oh, you want to be an accountant. I really didn't want to be an accountant. I didn't want to count money all day long. Um, or they said you can go into the bank because uh, you can become a manager and, you know, get good money. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll give that a go. And I went to an interview with a bank manager. This will horrify you. At the end of my interview, this gentleman said to me, well, your interview was fine, but we won't give you the job because within five years you'll have left to have a baby and got married and stuff and we'll have wasted our money on you. And that was how my interview ended. And I was so quiet and shy at the time that I just kind of shuffled out, went, oh, OK, thanks. Bye. And left not good now that won't happen nowadays because that can't happen thankfully but back in the 80s that was that was quite common i thought about joining the navy as a maths teacher because that could have been quite fun uh, but you had to sign up for 10 years eight ten years and that sounded like a very very long time to me so i didn't want to do that um, and then somebody said well have you thought about going into engineering now, I'll be honest, I didn't know what engineering was at the time. Um, I thought it was um, like the chap here, someone who fixes your washing machine. And quite often, if I ask people, you know, particularly people coming into secondary school, what do you think an engineer does? They'll say, oh, they fix things. You know, they fix my bike, they fix dad's car, they fix the washing machine. Um, that is a form of engineering, um, you know, and people will call themselves mechanical engineers or service engineers, but actually that's kind of on the, the mechanical side, it is a fixing somebody else's piece of equipment. What an engineer does is they design the equipment, so the washing machine was made by someone who designed it, and that's engineering, it's creating new things, it's saying okay we need something to save us having to wash clothes by hand, how can we make that work in a machine. So you come up with, well, we need a drum and we'll need some water and we'll need some electronics to control it and so on. And you design that piece of equipment. So engineering is about creating solutions to problems. And actually more than that, it's often about figuring out what the problem is. You know, what is the next best thing that we should have? Um, you know, for me, teleportation is where I'd like to go. Um, I travel up and down the M1 most days and some days it's fine. And some days I sit in a queue for ages waiting for other people to get out of the way. I want to be able to go from my home in a little box like this and appear where I want to be. I want to be able to teleport. I don't think we're going to get to teleportation, but we may be able to get to a much better way of getting me from A to B where I don't have queues. So that's the, the massive problem that I'd like to solve. I would like to invent a teleportation machine. I haven't quite done that. Um, but from the point of a, a STEM and a STEM career, that engineering aspect of being able to create something new and make things better and find out what the problem is and then make a better answer to it is what intrigued me. And I joined a company as a software engineer. Actually, I was titled a systems engineer. I really didn't know what that meant. Uh, didn't really know about the engineer bit and I didn't know what systems engineers did. What they do is they keep a view of the whole system that we're building and they own the whole system problem. So my world is in the world of defense. So uh, in my company, we make systems, equipment that protect our RAF and our Navy from missile attack. So we don't make any missiles, we don't make anything that goes bang, uh, and we don't make aircraft or anything exciting like that. But when an aircraft goes flying, so that one of our, you know, our current aircraft like Typhoon or F-35, you may see in the news, when they go into a danger zone and they have missiles looking at them that are trying to, to destroy them, to blow them up, what I do is I make equipment that we fit onto our aircraft that tells them where those bad guys are, tells them what mode they're in, are they about to attack, and then allows them to escape. It gives them countermeasures that can destroy the missile or just make the missile go somewhere else. So I make equipment, we tag it as equipment that protects those who protect us. So our RAF and our Navy are our defense. They look after us and, and they look after other nations who need help. And it's my job to make sure that our guys come home. 
Um, and that that really resonates with me. That's something that I, I feel really passionate about, that, you know, it's important that anybody who's joined the RAF or the Army or the Navy for the UK comes home safely to their family at the end of their, their visit, their tour, their mission. So that was the world I found myself in. Now, remembering that small person in the blue and white jumper who kind of could do sums um, and thought, well, I'll do something. When I was little, it was nursing or secretarial for girls. And here I found myself in a company that was making defence equipment. So a complete left shift from where I thought I was going to be. And I moved into simulation and modelling um, that used the software that I'd done that little little tasks when I was at Newnham. So I could write software and I, I got better at that. And I moved into the simulation team. So what we did was we wrote software programs that, that mimicked or simulated the environment that the RAF work in, mimicked all the threats, how they worked, how they would find you, how they would try and shoot at you. And then we represented the equipment we wanted to make in software and we could run war games. Um, so not quite like the kind of war games that everyone plays now on Xbox and, and all those kind of things, but, but similar in, nation, in notion really that we could test our equipment in software before we got to um, something that was real. And I did that for many years and I really liked doing that. Um, it was fun, it was interesting, it was something we could do quickly. And it occasionally got me to do things like standing up in front of lots of potential customers and talking to them about what we did and how it worked. Now, I'm someone who likes talking to people. I'm, I'm really happy in front of a group of people. It doesn't, doesn't worry me. I know a lot of people would find that absolutely horrible and not what they want to do at all. But for me, it was something that I enjoyed. So you'd often find me there, you know, talking about what we made and sharing that, that enthusiasm and that passion. And sometimes I'd get to go away on exciting trips. Um, I got to America a few times on trials. And once I got to go to see the Ark Royal, which is our, our previous aircraft carrier. Now she is there. Um, she's tiny compared with the new ones. Um, but that was our aircraft carrier that had airplanes flying off it and, and looked after us through things like the Falklands War and stuff. So I got to spend some time there talking with the people who were doing the job that I had made equipment for and understanding what they needed and how they worked and how I could make my things better. So all along, I'm trying to make the equipment we make as good as it can be for the actual people who use it at the end. And that's really where my, my passion is for this kind of work. And it's not something I expected at all. Um, a, I did spend quite a few months out in America with some equipment we fitted onto this aircraft. This is the Harrier jump jet. It, it's out of service now, um, but it was our one of our foremost aircraft for many years. And it takes off vertically and lands vertically, so you can fly it anywhere. And we provided the complete protection equipment for that aircraft. Uh, and it works really well. And there are people I now work with who are out of the RAF, but they flew those aircraft and they flew them in combat. And they have said to me, your equipment saved my life. I am here today because of what your equipment did for me. And that is something, it still makes me kind of have goosebumps even saying that out loud to you, knowing that you've done something that's made that much difference to someone that they have come home safely uh, is, is a real pat on the back for the work you do. So I'm often asked, okay, what's a normal day? Um, and I, I've been with my company for a very long time, 38 years now, in case you're doing the sums, I'll pretend I started when I was four, um, but I, I've been there 38 years, I expected to be there two years and move because that's what people did. Uh, but I stayed, I found more and more interesting things and I took on more and more roles. Um, I'd like to go back to that bank manager who said I'd have left within five years and, and put him straight and go, you could have had 38 years out of me your loss uh, but I don't know who he is and and it doesn't matter anyway but I'm still here so what do I do in a normal day um, I do do a lot of reading reports and writing emails and, and things like that you know every job has to have engagement and, and you're always doing things like that um, as a mathematician and someone who hated writing I've had to learn to to enjoy it and actually there is a there's an engineering creativity about writing about something really complicated and putting it in words that a, a foreign national can understand, someone for whom English is not their first language. So taking that complicated thing and making it easily accessible and readable for them and telling them what they need to know in a nice way. So actually, I quite enjoy it now. I, I won't admit that to my English teacher because she and I used to have to really kind of battle a bit, but actually I do quite enjoy it. So that's a chunk of my day, but often I'll be found in very strange places. The top right picture with all the spiky bits um, is an anechoic chamber. So 
So this is a chamber where all those foam bits um, stop any echoes from coming round. So when you talk in any normal room, you can hear your voice echoing around and your voice sounds as you normally hear it. If you were to go and stand in that chamber and talk, your voice sounds completely different because no echoes come back and you just get the clear sound coming through. And we use this in order to test our equipment. So we have to mimic being up in an aircraft way away from any kind of reflections and a missile system trying to find us using little bits of radio energy, a bit like your, your radio in the bathroom, but just slightly different. So we have these chambers so that we can set up a scenario that looks like that. And we take all the echoes away so it feels and, and represents a real world in, in free space and open air. So I'm sometimes in there fiddling around with equipment and testing it. I'm more often using something like the bottom left screen to look at what happened. So these are just dots telling me what came out from which things and, and where I saw them and whether I saw that nice big round humpy bit because that tells me something and stuff like that. And, and that really works for me because it's the maths I like, you know, it's Excel spreadsheets or it's just looking at patterns and saying, right, how could, how could I make that better? Where I've got those reds and, and blues on that top left graph, they should all actually be blue. Why aren't they blue? What can I do to make them better? So that's, that's the fun bit for me is fiddling around and, and getting that puzzle solved. Not so much nowadays, but I used to spend some time out in America working with things like this. This is a surface to air missile number six. It's a Russian system. It's actually still out and about and working. The two big things on the top uh, are two antennas. Um, the one that's kind of elongated will spin around slowly. And as it's doing that, it's sending out little bursts of energy. Any of those that reflect back from an aircraft, it then processes in the main tank bit and it can work out where the enemy aircraft are when they come in. So this is this is a Russian kind of system. So this would be operated by our enemies. The Americans have a few lying around that they've acquired. So we go and play with it. We go and use it. We fly aircraft against it. We check that they find it. And as soon as we know they're looking, because we can hear them, um, someone's come off mic. If you could just put yourself on mute, that would be great. As soon as we can hear those signals coming up to our aircraft, Did I get muted? Sorry, I heard someone else's mic go, but um, apologies. I'll go back and do that again, because I'm not sure where you lost me. So as that scanny bit is spinning around, trying to find our RAF aircraft coming in, my equipment on this plane is listening to that and going, you have an SA-6 looking at you and it's over there. So I know there's a threat over that way. At the minute, it's just searching. But the, the antenna on the top with a little fuzzy bit in the middle, that one will point at you and it will stare at you. And that's the one that they'll get the missile to follow up to hit you. So as soon as I see that one looking at me, then I know that aircraft is now in trouble. They're about to shoot at me. So now I've got to do something about that. And I've got to put some countermeasures out that will take that missile away and stop it hitting me. So that's kind of a very surreal bit of my work because I'm sitting inside an enemy system that we've acquired won't go into how we do that today um, and I'm trying to understand how it works so that I can make sure that what I do stops that from being able to take my aircraft out of the sky so it's the most exciting bit maybe but it's also the most sobering bit because you know that that's a nasty thing and there are lots of varieties of that um, ooh, oh hang on I've just popped off there big button so um don't get to go and play with those things abroad very often, but more often we fly around the UK in this little um, aircraft here. This is a six seater Piper uh, Navajo. I am always the very short one in the middle. I've got two hats on there because it was so cold and I still don't come up to Mike's shoulders. He is very tall, um, but I'm usually the little one sitting in the aircraft fiddling around with numbers. Um, the reason I've put this middle photograph in is the chap in the front there. This, this is a chap by the name of Scott and he is an ex typhoon pilot so he has flown against these kind of threats in anger in a wartime situation uh, and he is still here today so I take that as a personal pride that we've made sure he's here today he now flies us around in this because he works for this small company and he is sitting there with both hands up looking back at the camera so there's no hands on that plane it's just going and, and it's fine so lovely to see him and know that he's still here and his wife and three lovely boys still have him to come home to um, other things I get to do 
things like this. I really do enjoy sharing my passion, which I'm hoping you're hearing is coming through in my voice. Uh, that top picture is me at a, a big exhibition in London, uh, giving an interview to a journalist about what we do and, and how we make it better. They're always really scary for me because I have to be really careful what I say because the journalists always record and will repeat what you say and they might take it out of context and put it in an article. So I have to really think about what I'm saying to those. And then the other picture was last week. Uh, I was invited to a lovely event to celebrate uh, gender equality, something that we're all really, really passionate about. Um, at the minute, there are something like 15% of engineers in the UK are female. There is no reason for that not to be 50%. Uh, most of the women I work with, with in this industry are superb engineers, easily as good as the, the men. Um, we all bring different aspects and we all look at things in different ways. And having that mix is really important for getting the best outcome that we need. The only reason that number is low is because it's not seen as something that women would go into. We still think of it as the socks and sandals, hairy beardy engineers. Uh, I am a very typical engineer. We have young girls coming out as apprentices at 16, 17, who, are, you know are stunning they could be models they're so beautiful but they choose engineering because they like the challenge and it's all about just changing that perception of engineers and scientists and that's entirely why i'm here today to try and hopefully make you think that this could be something that you could do so, um, i'll just let this run through um it it, it is kind of because i like traveling uh, and it's a nice message to say in the kind of industry I'm in, I've been able to travel to all sorts of places. The flags are the ones I'm yet to go to, but we're talking with those countries, so, so may get to go. But more than just the travel, which is, which is always lovely to go and see places, it's really interesting to meet the different cultures and see how different cultures behave and work differently. Um, so the uh, South Koreans were incredibly polite and lovely. Uh, Japanese, I haven't been to Japan, but we work with them. So beautiful as a nation, they are so lovely and so lovely to work with. The Danes were, uh, could not do enough to help us and just, you know, everybody you met in the street would say hello, don't know who they are. Um, and yet some of the other countries, you know, America is interesting, the, the people one to one are lovely, but as a business, they have a completely different model of how they do business. It's very much to the letter. And if you don't do to the letter, then we'll take all your money or we'll take you to court. So it's, it's bizarre because you'd think they would be closest to us in terms of you know, how they behave, but actually in business, they're very different. So what I've learned from all the travel is to, um, you know, to understand different cultures and to be able to adapt how I do my work and how I would talk to and deal with people to make sure that we, we merge those cultures and meet somewhere in the middle. So it's lovely, but also quite important. So my current role, um, so after all those many, many years, uh, I've worked in simulation for a while. I did some um, training for a while, training customers. I've worked in sales for a while. That was, that was interesting. Uh, and I'm now in a team called Capability. And it's our role to define what we should be building over the next um, well, 5, 10, but actually 20, 30 years and building things that will come into service in 20 years, but will have to keep flying for another 10, 20, 30 after that. So it's my job to specify that capability. You know, what should we be designing now in order to meet what the future will bring? And it's, it's really difficult because we don't know what the future will bring. If you think back to your mobile phones a few years ago, you know, they were pretty good and they had a camera and they could do a few apps. Now we live with our mobile phones. They do everything for us. You know, I could run this off my mobile phone. There's enough bandwidth to run all this stuff. The apps allow me to do anything I want, you know, and every time we get a new version of our phone, we think, oh, this is awesome. It's got everything. But a year down the line, the next one will have more. And I'm trying to guess effectively where that mobile phone will be 20, 30 years ahead. So it is a bit of a guess, but uh, you know, that, that's my job. So top left picture is a, a new aircraft that's just come into the UK. Uh, it's, it's designated the MQ-9B and it's what you'd call a drone. They don't like calling it a drone because that sounds wrong, but it is a remotely piloted air system. So the pilot is on the ground. The aircraft is doing its job. And actually, if you look at the news tonight, I just heard that the Russians have managed to force down a drone. I don't know which one. It's not, I don't think it's one of these, um, but it's, one of these things that at the minute drones are really useful because you can fly them around for 24 hours over a battlefield area and they will tell you everything that's going on if you put our sensors on them um, and you don't need a person to be sat in that aircraft for 24 hours so they are really really useful for gathering information and that makes them actually a very high value target because if you're the enemy 
you don't want that picking up all the information. So it's an interesting thing. So that's me on some trials we did last year. Um, it was an experimental aircraft. So the bottom left picture, my colleagues thought was funny because it says X mental next to my head. They found that funny, but I did get to drive a forklift truck, which was really good fun. I'm very short. Okay, so how do I do my job? Um, you know, what, how do I decide what we're gonna build in the next 30 years? Um, well, all I can do really is ask questions and gather as much information as I can and then make a judgment based on the information I have. So uh, why is the first question? Why do we need this thing? What job is it going to do? And so forth. Now, that image there is of the next generation fighter that the UK are developing along with Japan and Italy. Uh, it's called GCAP, G-C-A-P, if you want to go and look it up. Um, and it will be an amazing um, fast jet kind of fighter aircraft, um, but it will also talk to every other aircraft around. So I know roughly what role they think it's going to do. And then I can say, OK, so to do that role, you're going to need capability that does this, this, this and this. Um, when is it needed? Well, this comes into service in 2035. So we've got 12 years. But we're trying to build something that we haven't made yet and we haven't designed and you know has to grow for the next 20 years further so i've got to decide what i can do now and how i can grow it um, so make my best decision but make sure i can grow it so that's the what you know what will i put into this system and how can i make sure that it will be able to develop and, and, and keep working we have a piece of equipment that was designed in 1969 that fitted onto uk platforms and is still on saudi tornado aircraft and is still working from 1969 so that's over 50 years I've done that right, haven't I? Yes, over 50 years, that piece of equipment that we put onto those aircraft is still working. That's a long life. Who will do this? Well, my team, obviously. Um, I have a, a great team of engineers. We need more. We've got something like 50 vacancies in our company for systems and software engineers. There are always roles to be filled with engineering. So if you're thinking, quite like a bit of sums and, and I want a job that I know I've got some you know it's going to last and I'm going to be in a job for a while. Engineering is a good one to go. And the how well, that bit I don't know yet. That will develop over the next few years and we'll get there. One thing we know it will have is something like this. So um, I'm going to hold this up to my camera. So this is a bright cloud. You can see from the size of my hand how big it is. It's a tiny little thing. Um, it's a little device that is an expendable decoy. So these things sit inside your aircraft as the skin of the aircraft. And when I get to that SA6 or another threat looking at me and shooting at me, then I press a button in the cockpit because I know that that missile is out there. I've told it. This pops out, these little fins spring out, um, and then it just drops to the ground. What it does as it drops to the ground is it sends back to the missile little radio signals that sound like my aircraft, but better. So as that weapon system is trying to track me on the reflections it's getting from me, this puts out better reflections, a bit nicer, better tune. So it plays a sound, plays a tune, and the missile will look at this and not at the aircraft. This will then just drop to the ground and the missile will follow it and will not hit the aircraft. So something like that is the kind of thing that we can produce and, and provide to aircraft to allow them to survive. Um, and the cost of that is a few tens of thousands per round compared with 70, 100 million for the aircraft that will be coming in. So a very cost effective way of saving it. The development of that has been 20 years. We knew we wanted to do this many, many years ago, but we couldn't get all the electronics and the battery and all the components in to something small enough to fit into the dispensers they have on the aircraft. So it took a while for all that to come through. And sometimes we do just have to be that patient to wait for things to happen. Um, so the professor thing. So I have many, many years uh, lectured at a university, Cranford University, where all of the senior uh, RAF and Navy guys come through to learn their, their extra specialisms, some of which is electronic warfare, which is what I do. So I've done that for many, many years. And last year, the university um, awarded me a visiting professor statusship for all the support I've given them over the years, which is astonishingly un unexpected. I didn't expect it at all, uh, but I can now call myself Professor Clark. Um, and it just, you can see, it just makes me grin because it seems so, so strange. And from that little girl who could sort of do sums and like to play the piano and thought I'd be a secretary or a nurse to find myself now a professor and, you know, talking to people about equipment that brings them home safe is just such a reach. I couldn't have predicted that at all. Um, and that's why I like to come and share my story to say anyone can do anything. My mum was right. You can be anything you want to be. You just have to follow what you like to do. 
Um, I've also been very lucky to be a finalist in the Women in Defence uh, Awards. These are run every year across every defence thing. So RAF, Navy, MOD, science branch, industry, everything. Um, and my colleagues have put me forward for the last two years. And uh, I've been a finalist in that twice. So I've got a lovely trophies, or two trophies, uh, a beautiful evening full of red and gold and braid. The amount of braid on some of the uniforms is unbelievable. So that's been really, really lovely as well. OK, so that's enough of me talking. Um, couple of things I've said there that I think are, are important to think. One is, um, you know, have a positive attitude. That's just kind of, well, I'll give it a go. How hard can it be? And the other is, you only have the information you have now. So if you're trying to make a decision about what you might do, you can't really look forward for 20 years and go, oh, I'm going to be something that nobody's invented yet. But from what you know about yourself now and what's out there, then that's a good place to start with where you might want to go with your career. And indeed, with things like choices of exams and stuff when you get there. So from the STEM point of view, uh, this is engineering based, but it works well for science as well. So are you someone who likes maths and physics? Um, now, when I ask this question and I ask people to put their hands up, very few people put their hands up. But actually, you probably find you don't mind it. You know, maths work for me I could do in five minutes because you knew there was a right answer and you could check it in the back of the book so you know you were done writing English and history essays used to take me hours so I love maths just because I could get it done really quickly uh, and there is always a right answer um, do you have a can-do attitude most people think yeah I do you know if somebody gives you a challenge or says oh yeah could you help me cook dinner today you go yeah okay that's fun and you do it you know because you think yes I'm going to get this done um, that's such a really important thing for any career, but particularly in engineering, where you may be taking 20 years to get to the end. Um, do you like solving puzzles? Um, I do. I still do Wordle and Nerdle and Hurdle and Sudokus and things because I just quite like that. It's, it's almost switch off time for me. Um, you may have other things you like to do that just get your brain kind of thinking about puzzles. That's engineering. It's solving puzzles perseveres so at this point I usually ask people to put, I won't ask you to do this but I usually say put your hand up if you think you persevere at things and most people your age would kind of go mm, maybe no not sure so then I'll say well do you play an instrument and if you do it, I can't see you and it doesn't matter but put your hand up if you play an instrument and that's probably a quarter of you maybe more and then I'll say okay do you play sport do you like playing sport a few more will put their hands up or do you play computer games you know Fortnite, any of that kind of stuff, a few more will put your hands up. And usually by now, about three quarters of you have got your hands up and they put your hands down. Um, if you do any of those things, you are someone who perseveres because you can't play an instrument without persevering. You have to practice and keep at it. And none of us practice as much as we should, maybe, but you do have to practice and you get better. That's persevering. Same with a sport. To get, to get good at a sport, you have to keep doing it. And to get, play any of your games, you have to keep doing it. That's all perseverance is, is just finding something you like and keeping on going. I was lucky that I fell into this engineering career and into this niche that I have. So I've kept going and I love it. Are you afraid to ask questions? You should never be afraid to ask questions. The worst thing you can do is not really know something and go, oh, I won't ask because you're likely to do then the wrong thing. If you're not sure, just say, no, sorry, I didn't get that. Can you, can you help me? Uh, just before coming here, I was in a meeting where we're trying to fix some, some features we found on something and the team know what they're talking about and they go, oh, yeah, well, we've done this and we've changed that bit and we've done this. And I am always the one, the most senior in the room, but I'm always the one going, sorry, could you just explain that? What, what's that mean? How does that work? And, and they, the first time I ask them, they think I'm being funny, maybe, but everybody is now used to it and they will explain right down to simple level for me until I can get to the same place as them. And then I can make the decision I need to make. Whereas if I don't really understand, I might make the wrong decision. So asking questions is always the right thing to do. So if any of those kind of tick for you and you think, yeah, I quite like a puzzle or yeah, I'm pretty good at sticking at stuff, then a career in or around STEM could be really good. You know, as well as the engineers designing stuff, we've also got, you know, the people like me, we've got the sales team, the procurement team who buy stuff, commercial, HR, whole load of careers around that are working in an industry that's exciting, but perhaps not being that pure engineer. But it's something you might like to think about. My advice to you all the way through your life, but certainly now, is do what you love. If you like subjects, do those subjects because you'll work hard and you'll get some pleasure from it. Um, there will be loads of people giving you advice and parents are very good at saying, oh, you don't want to do that or you do want to do that. 
they are telling you that with the very, very best of intentions. They want the best for you, but they're not going to live your life. That will be your life. So it's important that you decide, you know, this is what I really enjoy doing and this is what I love. This is what I'm going to do. And that is some advice to keep with you. The little bit of luck is also good. I've had many bits of luck along the way and they've always just kicked me into something that's been brilliant and I've loved. So always good. And then my, my final bit of advice uh, that I've certainly lived by is we only really regret the things we don't do. The chances you're offered that you kind of go, oh, well, I'm not sure when you didn't take, you'll look back and think, oh, I should have done it. If you do something and it doesn't work out, you can go, well, I learned from that, I won't do it again. But yeah, if you're given an opportunity, grab it, try it, learn from it and move on. So that's my whistle stop tour through my kind of life. Um, the, the couple of bits of advice. Oh, I forgot it bingled. Sorry, it's doing a jingle in my ears. Um, so the things that have st stood me in good stead and I think are important for this kind of STEM type life is think positive. Always just give it a go. Do your best. Do trust your instincts. You do know you are good. You are enough. You know, just just stick by what you think is right. Do challenge yourself and aim high, uh, but trust yourself. Always be open and honest. Uh, it's always about the people. The relationships with the people are so important. You will find people who are your tribe is the expression now. And for me, just keep smiling because that normally works. People will work with you and help you if you smile. And that is my, my pitch. Over to you, Mr. Derek. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. And I'm going to call you Fiona now. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think all those messages there, particularly towards the end with those pieces of advice, you know, I think we really couldn't have said that any better ourselves here in school. Okay. I thought it was really, really uh, a fascinating story, a fascinating journey. So I think the main thing from our from our end is, is thank you for sharing that. Um, I've got a couple of questions. If, if any anyone else on this call has questions as well, then I suggest maybe just type them into the box uh, as I'm giving my questions so that we can kind of manage it that way. One 